everybody to the second pen dialogue. This is this is confusing now because usually Mervyn stands up in sort of his godfather of books fashion and introduces everybody and does a whole lot of promotion. But he, he's now on the panel and he refused. Great. But now you have to sit still and you're now Alfred. Um, welcome everyone. This is the second um, pen dialogue that we're doing. I'm Margie Orford and I'm the, I have a fabulous title, Executive Vice President of South African Pen with a stress on the vice, if you like. Um, the first dialogue that we did was um, with Pierre de Foss and um, Desiree Lewis. Desiree Lewis around uh, issues around freedom of expression in Africa on this encroaching homophobic legislation that's sweeping everywhere. Tonight we're looking at the politics of publishing and mainly Nick Mklongo and I being I know, I've been censored. What I was going to say, Ingeborg, publisher, and other publishers here, is that we want to ask you why we don't get more royalties. Um, the PEN dialogues are part of South African PEN's program around opening up discussion around the literature of politics and the politics of literature. We've just had the Franschhoek Literary Festival, and I was very honored to chair a session there with Mark Haywood of Section 27, Carol Bloch and um, Eleanor Sisulu around access, children's access to information and to books in particular. Because one of the things we've been trying to formulate, and I hope we'll discuss some of this this evening, is that if you are not a literate reading person, you cannot be a full political citizen. So we're looking at literature and politics and we will whine about royalties, but essentially what I want us to think about, and those of you who are here can take away from this to think about, is how you are a full citizen if you cannot read and write. If you cannot read and write fully and properly in a way in which you can engage the politics. Because for me, and I think for, for PEN, which is the oldest freedom of expression organization in the world, it's 90 years old this year, um, what we believe is that freedom of expression is the foundation of all other political rights. It's that kind of hidden bedrock which enables you to do everything else. So welcome all of you. Um, those of you interested in PEN, we have a website, we've got brochures, we're like pro you know, very proper people. Um, you can find out more about what we do and how we work with PEN International. But I want to welcome the panel here this evening. Mervyn, world famous bookseller. Um, grouchy bookseller who hides in his office quite often, I must say. But he has done, and he is actually a member of PEN. We made him a member because we thought what he provides is an oral space for debate, which is a very important South African and African concept, the idea of oratia. So, Mervyn, thank you. Um, we have Ingeborg Pelser, who I've known as a publisher for a very long time. Um, she's with Jonathan Ball and has done some fantastic books. My favorite of which is a book called Dear Bullet, which um, maybe we could talk about that a little bit later as the politics of publishing. And Nick Mklongo, who is my like right-hand man of pen in Johannesburg. So he is here representing writers and Gauteng, which is a completely foreign concept, as you know, to us Cape Tonians. He's just endured Franschhoek, so he knows that. So welcome, all of you. Um, oh, I feel very small now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what we will look through, well, there will be plenty of time for questions afterwards if you want to um, beat up the publishers or the booksellers and praise the writers. There is going to be time for that. Um, uh, the problem with publishing, it is on the one hand it provides the bedrock, if we think through the spectrum of uh, book to newspaper publishing, is it is the bedrock that provides for freedom of expression. So it's a very important thing. It is also a business. And writing may be an art, but publishing, when all is said and done, comes down to dollars. 
So seeing as M Ingeborg is representing the entire publishing military industrial <laughs> complex of South Africa, I thought I would start off with you, um, Ingeborg, and having a little bit, because before we get to the politics, we need to have a look at the economics of publishing. And um, would you explain yourself? Well, firstly, there's definitely an expectation in the market that when it comes to local publishing, books should be cheaper than international ones, and yet it never works that way because our print runs are so much smaller than the international publishers, so your unit cost is much higher, and of course your market is incredibly small. I mean, I don't know whether you've heard the horrific statistics that only 300,000 people in South Africa buys more than 10 books a year, and of them, 80% are white women over 55. They so. were all at Franschhoek this week. Yes. <laughs> my, my, I have to just, yes. sorry. Yes, my sister visited from Namibia, and my sister sell, sells wine, and her boyfriend sells gums. So she asked me in her tactless Namibian fashion, very <laughs> loudly, she says, Margie, is there a law that only white women over 60 may come to this festival <laughs> with their handbag carriers, which was their the, the few yes. surviving husbands. Exactly. So, I mean, and if you think carefully about that statistic, it's mainly book clubs, so it's mostly fiction. And there isn't that much South African fiction. And what's done incredibly well in South Africa over the, well, since I've been in the book trade, which has been now roughly 12 years, is political biography does very well. Um, any current affairs book seems to do very well. Um, of course, there are some books like Spud that really... And John Mayer did much better overseas, including Margie, before you started to sell well here. But, I mean, it's a very, very difficult market to be in. So the challenge for us as publishers is to have a good mix of trying to find commercial bestsellers, which might not necessarily be good books, because, as we know, it's not necessarily good books that sell, whether it's like a voucher biography or a mock voucher, um, sports biography sell very well. We try and get those sort of four to six books per year that will sell more than 15,000 copies that will enable you then to do books that you really believe in and that you believe should be published, like Dear Bullet that Margie mentioned. So it's difficult to get that balance right because often you'll find a book that, like in the case of Dear Bullet again, which is a horrific story about a girl secretly who got shot in the neck with the bullet still sitting there and raped and sort of let, left in a pit latrine. And you think, okay, this is an important book to write about or, or to publish because of all the rape victims in South Africa. But you know beforehand, if you're going to sell one and a half thousand copies of this, you'll be lucky because it's not a well-known author, it is not a popular subject, people want to read for escapism, they want something light, and we also struggle against the fact that people don't read anymore. I mean, it's incredible, I work in the Ogilvy building, and when I speak to all those media people, or engineers, <coughs> or lawyers, or everyone that's there, none of them read, because everything's become instant, and about Twitter, and the internet, and TV series, and Game of Thrones and Grey's Anatomy, and it's not seen as social to, to to read really anymore. So we're trying to get the balance right between our mass market bestsellers, that, like I said, are not always good books, they can be, but often it's more what's marketable and how marketable the author is, and where they fit in or what's happening politically, and then to publish books that are actually important, but you won't necessarily sell that many copies. Well, there's that wonderful quote, I think it was Don Marcus, who says, publishing a volume of verse is like dropping a rose petal into the Grand Canyon and waiting to hear the echo. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mervyn, seeing as you are a seller of echoes <laughs> in the Grand Canyon of Rulon Street, how does the, the economics of the publishing world, how do you deal with it, and the book selling world? <laughs> Thought you were going to treat us to a poem, Margie. <laughs> we know. I, w I was the poet laureate of the book launch for a year, and they promised me free coffee and never paid up. <laughs> you were supposed to provide us with free verse, which also never happened. Sorry. Um, personal issues aside, what was the question? <laughs> the 
economics of publishing the, and book selling. Okay, the economics of, I don't know anything about the economics of publishing, the economics of book selling. Um, it's, it's quite simple, really. I mean, if you, if you, you know, run a uh, establishment like this, then you have uh, a bunch of, of obviously sort of set costs. Um, you know, things like as much as everybody who works here absolutely, you know, loves to work here and begs me not to pay them. I do actually sort of pay salaries every now and then just to sort of, because uh, otherwise the labor courts get... You know. um, but, you know, you have a bunch of things you've got to pay. You've got to pay salaries, you've got to pay rent, you've got to pay electricity, you've got to pay, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you've got to pay for all the books that you have in, in, on, on the shelves. Um, and so, I mean, there's a similar, similar element, at the, at, well, there's some commonality between what Engelberg was talking about in terms of publishing, uh, in the sense that sometimes you, uh, you know, you, you try and, and think that maybe you're gonna sell, you know, quite a few copies of something you don't necessarily believe in, uh, which enables you to, you know, buy a few more of, of other things. Having said that, um, it's it's one of the strange things. One of the joys of this place is that we sell very very little of the books that would kind of fall into that category. Um, not through lack of trying, um, you know. Well, we don't try, really try anymore. But um, I mean, it, it was it was fascinating when we opened the shop um, six and a half years ago. Um, you know, we, we, when you sort of doing your opening orders from all the publishers, and you've got you know obviously a limited amount of money that you can spend, uh, we sort of spread that between uh, buying books that we all of us who work here knew would sell because of our experience in the book trade, the kind of straight commercial stuff, and then balancing that off against the stuff that we really wanted to sell and we you know believed in, and we found very very quickly that actually the, the stuff that we knew would sell. Uh, didn't, and and that the people who were coming here to buy books were coming for something different to what you know people who were going to you know a, a, a bookshop in the mall to exclusive books or, or, or whatever. So, it's um, very lucky like that to have sort of a, such an educated market because I mean, in exclusive books, if they whatever they buy, if they don't sell it within three months, they cannot reorder it. And I mean, for many books, think about art books or. Many non-fiction titles, especially, do expect such a quick stock turn because it's all it's become like a supermarket. It's all about stock turn and piling up the best sellers. They've totally moved away from having variety. It's like the CNA model. I mean, CNA wouldn't even buy 10% of the list of what we publish, um, and they only want the best mass market sellers. Um, and like exclusive books, more and more because of this, so, and it's the corporate world that. I mean, even for ourselves, it's part of NASPA. It's like we can print stock of a book for a year, and basically, if you don't sell it in a year, then you're in trouble. So you must also that also influences your publishing decisions. Like, can the, the amount that you have to print to make it financially viable, so that because you can't just print 500 because then your unit cost is too high, and you can't sell the book for 500 rand. That can I, can I ask that, that mm. this is this is um, uh, confidential information? Um, how many copies of if, if you look just if you try and decide whether or not you're going to publish a book? Yes. What what is that that sort of you have break to, even point? You have to feel that you're going to at least look if it's a paperback without any picture sections. You need to sell at least two and a half thousand copies within the first year to make it at all profitable or financial. Well, even just financially bi viable. Usually, your break even would be on like one thousand eight hundred copies because of course. It's also, you don't really make much money in your first print run because if you've got all your editing and proofreading and typesetting costs and cover design, you only actually start making money when you reprint because it's then just the print cost. But I mean, print costs are also so, it's so difficult in this country. We publish all our illustrated books abroad, not only because the, um, the quality is so much better, but because it literally is 50% cheaper. But then, Especially the printing, the, the printing is 50% cheaper on cover or illustrated books, so cookbooks or art books or anything. It's as much as 50% cheaper and it's better quality. But then it takes three months longer because you must wait for the shipping. So often say we want to do a political book, say like Zuma Exposed, which we did two years ago. Then you think you can't print abroad because you don't have that time. You can't lose three months on... They have enough it. problems overseas anyway. They don't have Zuma Exposed like that. <laughs> I want to I want to cut into these too many people. 
and bring um, in the neck. And when I bring him in, I just want to point out the pen empty chair, which at all pen events around the world has an empty chair, which is to symbolize the writers in the world who are detained and imprisoned and silent and therefore absent from public, the public mm -hmm. space. It's a very, very old tradition. Um, and we'll come back to the, to the money and the politics, but I wanted to ask Nick, as one of South Africa's most irreverent, and he certainly gave a kick into the literary pants. Do you think so? Yeah, I think so, when he first published his book. But Nick, what prompted you to give up a sensible university career and dive into the Titanic of publishing? Uh, it is because I was um, a student at UCT and I failed. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, th th there was nothing else to do. <laughs> so a failed UCT student so becomes a writer. That absolutely <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> no, I failed, I failed in, my, in my fourth year. You know, and then I decided, wow, what is uh, what's the next thing that I'm good at? A step lower from being a failed student is being. Yeah, I agree with you. I have the same experience. <laughs> Let me write about it so that people who go to the university and ex uh, you know and experience failure, they don't commit suicide. So that's what I did. <laughs> it was almost all that you know, that I wrote. Yeah, but. Um, uh, 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 but, but you know, within the I, I like it because you know, within the black community where I come from, uh, let me not generalize it, black community and stuff, but where I come from, I come from Southern uh, What happens is that when you tell a person that you are a writer, the writing, uh, uh, what they think about is that you are a journalist. You know? I'll tell you stories about. People who always bring me uh, say, "No, can we meet for beer?" Yeah. I say, "Yes, okay." I've got this story I want to tell you about this girl, whatever, 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 you know, or about this taxi violence. So we we'll see that people will tell stories, thinking that we're going to publish it the following day on Daily Sun. So there's not, there's nothing of that uh, differentiation so far, you know. But having said that, it doesn't mean that people don't read. You know, they do read novels, but. Uh, 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 my novel has been, is one of the most read uh, 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 books around my community, but it's only one, only one of, uh, only one copy that has been circulated. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it goes to, to somebody else. You go, uh, you say, okay, can I get it next week? And they say yes. And then you go there next week. They say, oh, okay, it's with so and so. You go to so and so. No, no, don't worry, it's with so and so. So it circulates around. So we, our reading culture is different from yours. Because we, you have a sense of uh, a pride in ownership of, of a library and stuff. We, uh, uh, as black people in most cases, have been so deprived to such an extent that the only thing that we think about is having a 50 kg of uh, mini mini behind the door, you know, instead of buying a book. I understand your point saying that uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it, 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 you know, um, you only print this particular uh, amount, you know. And that's why I get so jealous when I'm put with Africans, uh, uh, you know, uh, writers, because they sell such a lot to such an extent that they can leave their jobs and be writers. With us black people, tell me one, only one black uh, 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 writer who is uh, uh, only a writer and not employed, like John van der Root, you know, or whoever, you know. I'll get, I'll tell you, I'll get to a point whereby I was at, uh, asked to go to France, I mean, I, I was in France last They always like me the French, you know, they think I'm the biggest thing that they say about them, you know. But <laughs> I went there, you know, you go in each and every train, uh, subway or whatever, it's John Mayer, it's that, you know, on the... Big billboard. This is Dion Mayer on the station. Dion Mayer, Dion Mayer, Dion Mayer. So I'm just thinking, oh, why, why, why doesn't Quella put in say anything wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so risky, you know? <laughs> according to them. <laughs> I don't know, but I think it boils down to the problem of, um, okay, according to from a layman's perspective, from a writer's perspective, because I would love one, that one day I also become a writer only, like other guys. 
That's why you see in most, uh, most black writers don't publish quite a lot. Because most of them are working somewhere else. And they have to publish at the same time, you know? So, uh, whereas we assume, I assume that most white writers, if more especially African writers, if, 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 with us blacks, if you sell more than 400, you are lucky. Eh? <laughs> I, I was lucky that Quella also did a reprint. But that's after how many years? After, uh, two th after 2004, eight years, eh? That's my publisher, uh, Will Ted, you know. <laughs> but I, don't know yeah. I don't know, do you know of many South African, even white writers that just write? No, I don't. It's, it's deal. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. But they've no, got a really choice. John van der Rote has got a choice. John Mayer has got a choice. Yeah, but they're not uh, many of them, though. Uh, 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 do you want but the first two with, of okay, overseas, that's okay, why Those two that I've mentioned, I imagine on the black side, who is there? Unless you've got yeah. a government tender to go anywhere else <laughs> in the world. There's, 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 there's no way in which... It's a lot of like Tony yeah. Stein. Yeah. The yeah. problem was, if, yeah. you, if you went to the government and said, I want to write fiction, yes. the cabinet would say, no, we do it ourselves. We read it ourselves. And the other problem is, like, what is fiction? Because there's a, a saying, and it's a greatest saying, actually, which I've, I've seen, I've, I've, I've read about, is that, you, you know, in, 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 in the U.S., because I've been there at some point, eh? They tell me that uh, you know uh, only important writers are, uh, are, are, are taken seriously. In Australia, I heard that all writers are seriously. In South Africa, you have to explain what a writer is. As I told you, that I have to explain that no, no, I'm not a journalist. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I write novels. <laughs> you know, to us, novels were taught about. Uh, uh, the, the, the crime writer who is very known from uh, bl uh, about black people, I mean, um, within the black community, I forgot his name. Okay, it's fine, it's not important. But what is more important is that our culture of reading is quite different from the one that we have. Uh, within the white communities that I've presented <coughs> in, I found that you do have, uh, you, and you place value, much value in right uh, 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 clubs, you know, reading, is it reading book clubs? clubs? Yeah. yeah, book clubs. You, place more value and you place more value in each and every one buying a copy, coming to sit around, maybe invite a writer and I can talk to you face to face, maybe a twenty of you. Within black community it's not that one will there will be twenty people coming with one copy and then all of them have read one copy. But they have read you. You cannot complain that they don't read. They have read you. So it's just a different culture within that. Nick, I wanted to ask, this is a question about politics, because the, the, our, the politics of publishing and writing changed in South Africa dramatically after 1990 and then obviously 1994. We organized an event here at the Book Lounge, I think, for to honor Lu Xiaobo, who was the um, Nobel laureate, a Chinese writer. And I just went through my phone and I invited, I think, five or eight South African writers from Albi Sachs through to a whole lot of one who had all spent time in prison, black and white writers, for what they had written. So the, the obvious politics of repression has changed completely with freedom of expression in mm. South Africa. Mm. It has not changed in many, many places. If you're gay in Uganda, you will go to jail if you write something. Mm. Or weirdly enough, in Russia. In China, you go to jail. In Mexico, you get shot. So we're not looking at that sort of politics. But the politics of race, I feel, plays very much, and this, around being a black writer, for instance. It still plays, I think, about being a female writer. Yeah. And there was a very interesting quote I saw by, by the English novelist Ian Banks, who was complaining about the publishing industry shifting from being a gentleman's club to um, owned world by, by five conglomerates. And I was thinking, as yes, for a woman or for a black person, you still are not a member of that club. And I was wondering, I mean, Nick, you've been, your novels have been very successful. Um, but, and I was on a panel with Angela McCullough, who said she got annoyed by being described as the best black female crime novelist. Yeah. I got pissed off because somebody said I was the best female <laughs> crime writer. Um, but then there, there is still that sort of idea that certain kinds of writers are invisible mm. and other ones like you, like Tutsi's from Soweto, yes. 
or like feminists from the Rheinland which is called shit and we, we're not actually part of the club. No, actually the good thing about coming from Soweto, you remain a good over. You know what a good over is? It's someone who create, a hustler. So everybody could. Soweto is the center of South African democracy. The road to South African democracy comes from Soweto. Think about it, 1976. Eh? If you want to check about Mandela, where they come from, they all claim to come, to, even, even though they come from Transkei, they always say we are from Soweto, hence Villa Gaza State, eh? you know? So everybody claims, that's where I'm from. Our next president, uh, 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 who will be uh, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, comes from my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's, why, that's, how, that's how important we are. So the president just so, so Julius Malema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, Julius Malema won't see anything. Yeah. Won't see anything because uh, I think white people will you will never like his, his politics because he's going to send you to the sea. He calls you pieces of the ocean. One leg is in Europe, one leg is in Africa, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. So 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 uh, oh, how can you vote for that such a person? So that's the reason. I, I mean, uh, so but the ANC uh, we have. Uh, uh, Ramaphosa, who is uh, staying in my neighborhood where I was born in Shawe, you know, he actually stole through from my home. So that's the one who is going to be a federal president. So you must please, if you want to know about it, that's why you have to buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> because I write about, about the streets, where it comes from. So that because whites are good in analyzing the psychology of people. So you can analyze it quite nicely that before, because my books are before he, uh, there were uh, 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 tar roads in my neighborhood. So you know, I said, this guy, so his mind is still dusty, maybe, <laughs> when he does A, B, C, D. But the most important thing is this, you know, uh, is that um, you mentioned one very important point about uh, 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 the inhibitions of writing within the black culture, like what is it, the text that we get, is that the difference between us, you know, and other uh, uh, writers is that there's culture on top of politics. Let, for instance, I'll give you an example of Tandem Kolo's and book. Well written, quite beautiful book called A Man Who's Not a Man, talking about circumcision. That's not allowed. So it will never be promoted, you know, by many uh, uh, people. Because uh, uh, the right to passage into manhood is not promoted. You, you don't have to say it to us in patriarchal in most of our families. But another point that I wanted to mention is that uh, uh, actually uh, 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 it's only uh, actually that's why I'm, I always uh, even though I have to yeah, no, it's not promote you have you don't have to say it was still patriarchal in most of our families but another point that I wanted to mention is that uh, uh, actually uh, 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 it's only uh, actually that's why I'm, I always even though I have to catch a plane at eight today you know I, I said I have to come here because this is the place that I love best because it's got titles of different African writers. It's not put as if it's a, 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 a you know, African section. Have you seen that in, in exclusive books? It's put as an African section. They, longer have, they no longer have a space. You know why? Because they are about more than six, six, 60 black writers that are there. You know, that cannot be promoted simply because the space is not allocated. It's only two shelves. So that's why, yeah, it's the, the space is only yeah, two it's, shelves. It's, yeah. it's but stupid. also, I'm not uh, uh, letting you lose as a, a publisher. <laughs> I just want you to say. You publishers as well have a problem. You know, the problem is that you you have this, uh, you don't invest in writers. That's what I think. That's my humble opinion. You don't invest in writers. What we well, let's, what let's, we mean let's give Ego book. Um, First, Engelborg a chance, chance. To, okay. to defend to herself. I was just saying, uh, there is a problem that it's good and bad that there are separate sections in bookshops, ex in exclusive books, for African fiction <coughs> versus general fiction, because the, that book club market that I spoke about, they do not go to the African fiction <laughs> shelf, because there's still a perception that it won't be as good, and... And there is also a perception that it will always be about political issues or there'll be a heavy undertone. And so that's why I, I went to a panel at Franschuk over the weekend and Damon Galgut and uh, Michiel Heinz and Lauren Beaker spoke then. They said they simply more and more set their books in other countries because there's a relief from the fact that they don't have to write in a, a political undertone or somehow talk about rape or violence or whatever. <coughs> Otherwise, they won't seem like 
responsible fiction writers sort of in South Africa. So it releases them from that. So, so <coughs> there, there is still a perception that South African fiction won't be as good. So the, book, the average book club people don't buy it. That's why more and more we get bookshops to put your books, for example, in general fiction because the, it doesn't even have to be set here. They would put it in the South African fiction section, which is still frowned upon. Um, Engelberg, though, I wanted to, I mean, Doris Lessing said, and I'm going to come to you now, that nothing sells like success, and that's the problem with, with publishing. And um, publishing, like book selling, is a marginal um, industry, and we're idiots to be part of this. We should have done something else. <laughs> but um, how do you deal with risk? Because one of the biggest questions that I want to lead into is how we create uh, new and different readers. Why it is only ladies over 65 who allowed, or 60 who allowed to have books? Something happened along the way. So, what I want to get from both of you is how you deal with what are perceived to be risky books. And I have to tell you that being a woman crime writer is perceived as being risky. I was advised by several publishers when I started to publish as M. A. Orford. And then I said, but everybody knows now that people with initials are, are women pretending to be men. No, I mean, <laughs> like dicks yeah, without chicks or whatever. We just published it Liz McGregor's book, Springbok Factory, as Elle McGregor, because when she published a previous rugby book called um, Touch, Pause, Engage, it didn't sell very well because people thought, who is this woman writing about rugby? She can't possibly know what well, she's That's quite an about. interesting concept. Touch, yes, pause, then, engage with a rugby. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, that's a rugby term, but, actually. <laughs> but maybe we could get to, to yeah. move it because you've managed to deal with this hurdle of selling supposedly risky commercial books. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what, what risky books are. Um, but I, I, I just want to pick up on a, on a couple of things that have, that have been said. Um, the, the first is, there's been a lot of, um, I mean, we've, we've heard a lot about how there's so few people, relatively few people who buy books in this country, how print trends are so small. Um, how we've heard from Nick how, you know, sort of, uh, there are very, very few authors who actually make enough out of uh, writing their novels uh, to just write. Um, and also granted how that handful of writers all happen to be white, and that's all absolutely true. Um, th there's another part of the story which is a hell of a lot more positive, and I think it's, and while, you know, I, I don't like sort of um, ignoring reality, I think this is just as important a part of reality. I mean, the one is, I mean, Nick, hold up your book. Um, mm -hmm. No, no, yes. don't, don't speak, just hold up your book. Um, <laughs> and, this this book was published last year, um, and I'm not saying this because Nick's here. This is one of the finest novels we've written last year. Okay, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> no man, this is like survive, literary survivor. <laughs> Hold your book up. Um, it is. It, it is an absolutely phenomenal novel. Nick is doing things, and and and, and maybe if you're talking about kind of uh, taking risk in fiction, I, I I don't know, but it, I, if I understand the concept of risky writing then that's what Nick is doing in that novel. I mean, he draws this um, uh, amazing this sort of dual narrative between contemporary Joburg and what was going on in, in, in MK camps in Angola 20 years ago. Um, I don't know what's risky, but, but that probably is, if there's such a thing as risky fiction. My point is that, I mean, I think that it's an absolutely brilliant novel and everybody should read it. Um, it is not alone in terms of what is being published in South Africa at the moment. We are blessed with a plethora of amazing books that have come out over the last, the last few years, uh, which are taking South African literature in an entirely different direction. Um, South African writers are re-looking, re reimagining what is going on in our country through literature. There's nothing predictable about it. There's nothing staid about it. There's nothing boring about it. Um, do those novels sell 20,000 copies each? No, they a don't. 1,000 if you're lucky. Uh, really? so, is. Uh, Even maybe. if it's very, we've had some books you know that are well reviewed and, and, and then we can't sell a thousand if it's fiction. Yeah, but Ingeborg, sorry, you guys publish very, very good stuff. You publish about two novels a year? No, no, that's, that's you, why. You, you, uh, okay. <laughs> that um, why. There's a lot of amazing fiction coming out. And, no, no, and I, don't know, I don't know how many they sell. And as long as they sell enough for publishers to keep publishing them, I don't care. 
um, to be quite honest, on a, on a purely, yeah. you know, I, I want them but to sell more. But that's why I say there has to be a to, balance yes, but in we, order we, to do those very good fiction titles. But any discussion of South African publishing, book selling, the book world, whatever, I think has to take cognizance of the fact that what is being published, the breadth and the, the, the importance and the brilliance of what is being published in this country at the moment is unrecognizable from three years ago. Let but do you feel, ago. though, that it goes to a new market? I feel most of the market remains the same. Okay, so let, let me put something else into the, to the mix, because one thing that has shifted publishing... In, Can I yep. just say one, one thing quickly? Sure. Sorry about that. Um, and that's something else that, that I think is absolutely crucial. When Nick talks about his book, um, one copy of his mm, book mm. being read by, I put a number on it, um, 30 people, 40 people, 50 people... Um, in terms of the importance of that, that is the same as those 50 books being sold. We, Nick, isn't making money from those 50 books being sold, but what is more important is that that book is being read. And let's celebrate that. Let's not just see it as something crap. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 he mentions a very, very beautiful point. I, I think, okay, m my point here is that uh, it's unfortunate you're not my publisher. My publisher, <laughs> you know. He's just ignoring you. Yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 what, uh, uh, what I want to say is that I, I, I also, I, I, I even, uh, I doubt if ever our publishing houses have got a, a marketing department. <laughs> you know, I, 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 that's what I doubt. That I, I, I even doubt. You know, I even it depends doubt. what you see. No, because because or... because you know you don't follow the trend. What's happening here in the, in the country at the moment? I mean, we're a digital country, for instance. Uh, people use Facebook. People, you, you, you know, there's a book by Queller, which has just been uh, 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 what is this? shortlisted for Sunday Times. Eh? Yeah, let me just show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one it, what is, is this one. Eh? Yeah. It's just been shortlisted. If the writer doesn't write about it, that I'm shortlisted, See? blowing his own horn, nobody will know about it. Eh? Do you know about it? Who knows about it that is shortlisted for Sunday Times? No. No? Is there marketing now? It not was only announced now. yesterday. It doesn't way. matter. You <laughs> announce, take, 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 uh, I mean, you, you must make, make, make use of this uh, uh, social networks. Immediately. It comes out. Immediately. Three. You know? The book is there. People will know about it. I mean, uh, will definitely. Know. You didn't know about it at the moment. So that's the thing that Quella is doing. But I also feel like if ever there's, it was Dion Mayer, because you, they've got a particular, uh, 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 you know, author who they have to push his agenda. That this one definitely is. Is it the thing with Dion Mayer? You don't have to push him anymore. No, no. People uh, will but, but, to uh, buy the new yeah, one. I, I understand you, mm. but. If you keep on pushing people uh, uh, that are have or you don't no longer need the pushing, mm. how are the others going to grow? Mm. Mm -hmm. They're not going to grow uh, as long as you don't focus in the market. So in South Africa, uh, I think we must just stop bitching about as uh, uh, you know uh, publishers. Publishers mm. need the marketing department, a uh, right marketing department. Last uh, yesterday, I went to because uh, I check everywhere I check. Eh? <laughs> I went to Clarks. I, I just walked. I like bookshops quite a lot. I want, uh, uh, you know, on because uh, uh, here I know the, the books I'll get. Eh? I saw the most beautiful thing was uh, I saw Andrew Brown's books out there. And I think there was a marketing person who said, okay, have this book here. I don't know the political dynamics of uh, how your relationship. Okay, I say, now, listen, yes. your relationship, <laughs> your relationship with the, uh, 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 you don't have the relationship with bookshops. Sometimes you needed that uh, a marketing department who say, uh, Mervyn, uh, do you still have Nick Sway back home? You know? Mm. And then Mervyn say, ah, only one copy is left. And say, okay, uh, I'll phone you tomorrow to find out whether that copy is sold so that I can bring more. And then we, we got. Do that you, you don't. No, uh, oh, do. oh, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, you, 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 Nick, you, you might do it. Nick, I have James to... is not doing it. Uh, <laughs> my publisher there, they are not doing it. Nick, Nick I yeah. have to give you another so glass of wine. Because um, you get any writer 
you give them a mic long enough and they yeah, will exploit. It. No, 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 no. They attack the marketing department of the publisher. But what I what I want us to to have a look because I completely agree with you, a hundred percent. Despite having worked in publishing before, I became a writer. Um, once I went over to the light side, which is writing, the dark side is publishing, I totally erased from my fa mind the fact that publishers do actually like to sell books. Um, because I feel I have to interject to just... You can interject in a minute. You can interject in a minute. We're fiction writers, of course we make everything up. But um, One of the things that has really shifted around is how, and I, I think that Nick... Um, pinpointed some of that is that the old ways of reaching um, yes, an okay. audience mm. of a particular kind through book reviews has really shifted. The, the review pages are gone, despite Ben Willems's heroic um, efforts to keep them alive on Book SA and in the Sunday Times, and he's done something very interesting there. But more and more um, authors have to connect with, public, with the public in a very different way. And mm. it, Part of it is digital publishing, part of it is um, self-publishing. Um, and extreme self-promotion. Yeah, and extreme self-publishing you get as well, yeah. but um, you know, there, there's a whole, there's a whole... You don't market them. And then, who are all profit. Well, you're making profit, I'm making profit. You have to market me, you don't have to... You have to Anyone only makes profit if but, you But you have to, you, 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 what happens is that you have to be able to take risks. And say, okay, let me uh, 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 let let's do this. Okay, there's a book club over there. I don't know if ever I don't know whether if Quella, my publisher, know about any book club existing. Because <laughs> if they knew, they will invite me to and say, oh Nick, there's a particular book club which wants you to come and and do uh, uh, reading. If I'm not invited here in Cape Town by Open Book, there's nobody who invites me here in French Hook. There's nobody who invites me. And always, as well, I love Open Book and French Hook because. Those white, old white women, they're the ones that are buying. <laughs> they're great, and we they, all yeah, love them. Yeah, they're, they're buying. Oh, all of them, they're, they're, buying all books. Of, yeah, they're buying. But it's not through my publisher who is marketing me. It's through my book which is marketing itself. And through myself who is marketing myself. So what is the publisher doing? They're sitting there waiting, okay, they will call. You know, you know, like working in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in this uh, uh, what, 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 what do you call it? The call centers where you wait for a call. <laughs> okay. They will call in order ten. Nick, uh, gonna, tomorrow they will call. I'm gonna waiting stop for you. Godot. I'm gonna <laughs> stop you now. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm gonna answer, ask some. Okay, you can think of your question. Um, I put okay. the title for your next book, which is Nick of Longo Loves Old White Women. It will sell <laughs> like hotcakes. <laughs> But two things, sorry, I have Berman's to. Berman's going to say two to, things, and then we'll have some things. questions if okay, anyone wants to. Okay, firstly, uh, the old white woman thing, or the middle-aged white woman thing. Or can we just please <laughs> fucking get over this, okay? <laughs> it, yes, they may be uh, over-proportionately represented in book buying in South Africa, but it is not as extreme as people are making out. Uh, there are actually some black people, even some black men, um, who buy books. Uh, they buy a lot of books from us, etc., etc., etc. So let's just let's like, yeah, you know, just cut that generalization, please. Firstly, secondly, when we're talking about um, marketing of, of books and trying to sell more books, I think the point that and I think and I think this is, this is why Margie was asking the question, which I think we've all ignored, is that the the issue is not I don't think about. Um, booksellers or publishers or writers kind of pointing fingers at each other. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is that in order to sell more books and to get more people reading, those are two completely separate issues and they're both really important for different reasons. Um, publishers, authors and booksellers all need to be thinking in completely different ways mm -hmm. to how they were thinking five or ten years ago. So, I mean, when you talk about the cost of a full-page advert in the Mail and Guardian, that's absolutely insane, and I wouldn't expect you to spend that on a book. I'm not even sure that that would make any difference, uh, or how much difference it would make. The, the issue is not about spending money. The, the issue is about thinking creatively about it. I don't know the answers, we but, but that's something we that are all grappling with. Definitely no, I'll give you books one, one of the answers. The people who buy books in their adult lives are people who grew up with books being read to from infancy. And one of the very interesting things, you might want to look on the Daily Maverick website, uh, Mark Hayward, who presented on the pen panel in Franschhoek, was talking about the importance for of 
distribute, and there are a whole lot of programs that are going on that little black kids in Vilakazi Street, wherever, um, the Eastern Cape, grow up with books in their hands that they read and dispose and read and dispose so that it becomes essential that you have a book. I mean, so, so some of this book poverty, as I would call it, um, is an indicator of the, the legacy of um, Bantu education, of apartheid, and of an anti-intellectualism that I was very worried about that Zuma brought up against, this idea of clever people, mm. people with books. So there's a profound political issue despite us quibbling about royalties, is that grown-ups buy books if they had books as children. And for a person who who's always had books, you have to have a book like you have to have a glass of water. I'm now going to see, we've got a few more minutes left to say, oh my God, all of you. Um, we're going to go, um, maybe we'll just take three questions, just ask questions. Um, if you can, no comments or lectures. So, you wanted one? Thank you. Yeah. Can you take the mic and... Where are we starting? Okay. Start there. If we could just take two, uh, one, two, three, and then we'll have responses from this. I'll try to explain it in one or two sentences, but I, it's just an idea that I want to bounce. What if, through self-publishing, NGOs or can be created by corporates? So, a lot of corporates are looking for, say, a way that they can give back. So um, I know if someone is searching for NPOs to sort of promote them or the person have a certain amount of money to give to that. And then these, these people, they, like you said, they have to believe in that, that book to be able to plant money to invest in it. And by that way, they have like they acquire a person of the language literary sort of industry, employ, employ them at their corporate as a separate person and in a way they can give back their money, whether it's like ten percent or whatever of their big profits, and that way the NGOs can help the book poverty or I don't know if that makes sense, it's just like three videos, yeah. That's the Lillian Jacket. How come the Afrikaans authors can have trailers put onto Afrikaans T V? Mm. Okay, I can answer that. Trailers <laughs> of trailers books. Mm. Okay, we'll get to that. I'm sure it's the blue one, but okay. So <laughs> um, we're t we talk about the middle-aged woman who is buying books, and I think we're basically talking about an English reading society. What about translation of books and having books where people can read the books in their own language? How much of that is happening, and how much would that increase readership? Okay, so we've got okay, one more question and then we'll get responses. Thanks. Uh, with all due respect to the actual bookstore, I'm a person who travels and buys Kindle books and audio books in significant number. One of the things I'd say about both those options is that I can get a quick read on a book. I can read the first chapter of a book. I can listen to somebody read to me three pages worth or something. Um, and I have to confess that I have been exposed to and chosen to buy some books without judging it by the cover or the name of the author or whether I've ever heard of them, but simply by those other categories. And I'm wondering whether you don't see, I mean, there are not enough South African books on audiobooks because I've listened to practically all of them. And uh, so, and you've got a tourist industry, and those people are going to be looking at those kind of books. And then they're going to go back to their home countries and can fertilize for you and say, this was really good, whatever. So, so we have four questions, which I think is what we're going to have time for. One is the first one was about how corporates can basically give back to providing books, what mechanisms would um, do that. And I think that's important to not affect a very important industry. How do we invest? And I know the Open Book and Mervyn does plenty of that. Mm -hmm. Penn also does quite a bit of that. The other one is how do the Afrikaans writers get trailers onto TV? Trailers made of their books. They're such evil people. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I've never seen the, one. The, I know somebody no, no. Yeah. And then the third question was Your about mind. to expand <laughs> to expand the reading public um, 
by having languages and uh, books available in more than just English and Afrikaans, which is a big political question, which we will actually be addressing in another pen dialogue, the whole idea of mother tongue and yeah. literacy. But maybe um, next thing is you represent the entire North English speaking world. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Um, it picks up on a lot of what you were saying, the, the mother tongue issues about how people come to read and how they don't come to read. And you might be able to pin it back to what this lady in the white was asking about how we can get a new generation of people who are not used to books, those evil book lenders who buy one book. What, what can be done about doing that people who are not used to books and are not used to reading stuff in mother tongue? I think it's, it's not uh, the fact that people are not used to reading in mother tongues or what, you know. It all goes back to what you said earlier, the risk, you know. Publishers are always afraid of risks, you know. I'm just saying that uh, uh, because, I mean, I understand it. It's all about will I gain in anything from this, you know. It's, it's about studying the market. So they should study the market, perhaps, I guess, you know. And maybe that element of risk will dissipate, you know. Because at the moment they want to say, uh, because look at the publishers in South Africa, for instance. I don't know any of the Zulu or any other language publishers in South Africa. Quela uh, actually yeah. has done books in Isikosa, and, but and I know what you um, even translated the Little Prince. Maybe it's close but, because they think they think there's a risk. But no, it's not. It's not that. Firstly, it, you can't just say risk because we don't want to take risks. Also, it is a business. One one has to be able to at least break even with your costs yeah. to take risk. Otherwise, you'll be fired. Yeah. So and then we, you can't continue. Then you'd have to be an author. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> the thing is, I've I used to work at. New Africa books, and we published a wide variety of children's books in all the 11 languages. And the only way that we could sell them was if they got prescribed. So it works definitely through government channels, but in a normal bookshop, there aren't Isikosa Zulu or multilingual sections at all. And I mean, some of the Kosa books that's been published just and hasn't sold, unfortunately. And book. Mm. I'm going to have to stop this now. Our Nick has to abandon us. Oh. Go to Joburg. Oh. And go to Joburg. Do you know it's dangerous then? <laughs> <laughs> You're leaving the land of Zilla. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> the only place that is dangerous is Cape Town because you cannot, Zilla said to you that you cannot drink after two, eh? And she might, she might, she might kiss you. Just don't kiss her on the way to the airport. Every time. Now. Can we just give Nick a, yeah. and promise to Okay, let me tell you one thing. Uh, you have been a lovely audience. So what I'm going to do, I promise you, uh, you must hold Frankie responsible for uh, not me not coming for an uh, open book. Eh? Because I want to sign some books. Okay. Yes, so you heard it. Eh? So uh, I'll, be, I'll be signing books in the open book. <laughs> and I'm waiting, how many are you? Uh, around 20. I'm going to yeah. sign 20 books for free. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm going to, to close off. It's just past seven. I do not, I'm going to find out how those trailers get made for Afrikaans TV. Okay, you'll have to tell them over one. I'm sure it's, no, there's... I'd like to say something. Yep. I, I just want to respond because I'm a book journalist and I'm working with those people that is often much criticized, namely the marketing department of books. And there is a reason I can appreciate that one can criticize some of it. But I have now been working for 30 years as a book journalist and there is a wonderful, sometimes marvelous response from these people to promote. Sometimes there is also there is an enormous amount of problems to get authors to work with journalists. They're not always available, they don't want to be available, etc. I also want to say that one of the interesting things is this, that the newspapers which I'm working for, which is in the Afrikaans section, is the biggest promoters of English books in this country, much more, more so than any other English publication. Secondly, you ask about uh, the book trailers of Afrikaans, that is on CakeNet, which is the television uh, channel. 
that is sponsored by a uh, national uh, book on entertainment, which is a television uh, channel that is sponsored by a uh, national uh, book handle, and they promote these. Uh, every, it's not an African center that are being promoted there, but which is in their store. I think, and then there's also Litnet, which promotes a great deal. I think it is harder to look. The, 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 you haven't had conferences of the amount of publishing and promotion that has been done, especially from the Afrikaans space. You're absolutely right, and I must say, I get more widely reviewed in the Afrikaans press, with longer reviews and more considered interviews than the English press. So sorry for the glib joke. But one of the things that's interesting, and which people dealing with African languages have been looking at more and more, is how an Afrikaans reading public, public and book industry and that sort of thing has worked and how that can be uh, replicated in other languages if it's possible. I also do know that the marketing, my own marketing has been fantastic. <laughs> Jonathan Ball. Um, Mona, did you want to, any last comments from either of you before we close off? Uh, when, when Nick leaves the room, I'm just <laughs> silent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think we can we can continue the conversation informally. Informally, uh, yeah. in that case, I just I, run through what's up, you, yeah, you I just like to thank you all very much for coming and for taking part of it. I think this is a very important conversation to have about how you keep a literary culture going, both commercially and um, in terms of the politics of pleasure really around reading and engaging and imagining such a complicated society. Um, Engel Pulsar, thank you very much. Publishers always get beaten up and you're one of the nicest publishers.